one. Hello, and welcome to our virtual town hall, Our Future, Our Planet, a virtual town hall dedicated to the ever so urgent issue of climate change and how climate change is on the ballot this election. Our host tonight is Senator Bernie Sanders, and we have a bunch of special guests lined up for you, including activist and actor Mark Ruffalo, writer and author David Wallace Wells, and Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in Tennessee, Marquita Bradshaw. You'll also hear from everyday folks who are experiencing climate change firsthand and what they are doing about it. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Ms. Sirivik and I'll be moderating our event. If you're joining our webinar, I wanna say thanks for joining our webinar and go ahead and use the chat feature to say hello. If you can, tell us where you're joining from. We like to see uh, where folks are coming in from. Also, you will have the chance tonight to ask questions of our panel. So you'll use the Q&A a uh, button at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions for the panel. Uh, we got folks joining from New York City, Decorah, Iowa. I'm from Iowa. Hey, Iowa. Um, we got Denver, Colorado joining us, people in Houston, North Carolina, uh, Michigan, Massachusetts. Great to see all of you. Thank you for joining us tonight as we discuss climate change. And because we are discussing climate change tonight and the way in which climate disasters are changing our life, I would be remiss not to mention Hurricane Zeta. Hurricane Zeta, a category two storm, is making landfall on Louisiana's coast tonight. We expect to see the storm surges from Louisiana to the Florida Panhandle. Evacuations are underway for much of the coast, expecting widespread powder outages, and also that could affect polling locations. More than 3,000 people are still in hotels right now from the two hurricanes that had just hit. So for those of you who are down, down south in Louisiana and Florida, uh, wishing you well and please stay safe. And at the same time, the coronavirus is surging in the US. More than 70,000 cases being reported every day right now. Last Friday, we had more cases reported than any other day since the beginning of the pandemic. So we have a lot to discuss tonight. We're going to begin with a short video featuring several folks from across the country. We'll hear from Tim Lovell, who recently returned home to Iowa after his family's farm was destroyed by the derecho that hit Iowa in August. We're going to hear from Joe Mangino, who lost his home in Hurricane Sandy which was the deadliest and most destructive as well as the strongest hurricane of the 2012 season. Joe is now the co-founder and president of the New Jersey Organizing Project. So let's take a look at that video and see what folks have to say. Our government is so short-sighted again and again and again. And we're seeing that right now with coronavirus, when there was every opportunity to have our pandemic response team, we knew months in advance of this deadly, deadly crisis that this was going to happen and wreak havoc on the world. And we did nothing. We didn't listen to any of the experts on coronavirus. And that same exact pattern is what we've seen with climate change. I lost my home, I lost my business, and I lost a second job to Superstorm Sandy. The increasing frequency and strength of storms is directly related to climate change. I witnessed the destruction. First hand, it was a total loss. More than 40 trees on our farm, and almost every building was damaged. I know that Black folks have uh, the highest death rates for the coronavirus, and they also have the highest rates of asthma. Mm -hmm. um, and that's due to environmental racism. Recognizing the intersectionality of the climate justice movement on the lines of race, class, and gender is the only way that I will have a shot at a future. I am voting this election because my mother earth needs my vote. Climate change has affected our rivers and streams, which directly affects our culture and sustainability of my tribe. Our streams, our rivers have been detrimented by low flows and warm water quality, moving our salmon near extinction. It is now time that we all vote to protect the sacred. Whether it's, it's floods, it's fires, it's the uh, derechos that were in the Midwest, whatever the extreme weather event is, we are past time for action. These things are a part of you. We played hide and seek in those buildings. We climbed those trees as children. I love this place. I love this community. And it's been devastating. That this is a time we have to recognize like whether or not we go back to supposed normal.
Thank you to all of you who lent your voice to that video and setting the tone for tonight's discussion. Folks, we are just six days away from the most important election in modern history. We are here tonight to talk about how climate change is on the ballot. And to start off our program, I'm excited to welcome to the show, Mark Ruffalo. Mark is a co-founder and a board member of the Solutions Project, a national organization with a mission to accelerate the transition to 100% clean energy and equitable access to healthy air, water and soils by supporting climate justice organizations, especially those led by women of color. Welcome to the show tonight, Mark. Hey, Misty, I'm so glad to be here um, with all you people. And uh, yeah, that was that was really powerful and moving uh, video. Um, and it, it is, it kind of tells you uh, what we're up against right now. You know, people, uh, you hear it time and time again that, um, you know, uh, this is the most important election of our lifetime, uh, every single election cycle. But this year, it's true. And um, it's true in, in, in just the most profound ways. Uh, it is the most important election of our lifetime. And when we talk about voting, um, like our lives and futures depend on it, that's not rhetorical. Or, or hyperbolic either. That's, that's the reality that we are all facing with this particular election. The window of our ability to start to really mitigate the, the catastrophes that are coming our way is closing and will close within the next four to eight years. Um, the suffering and pain and dying of our planet and our people um, that, that, that this planet has been experiencing isn't going to magically go away. It's going to take all of us collectively coming together in love, appreciation, humility, and humanity for the planet to put, it, to put us back on the right path. And the first step is going to be electing people who, I mean, I don't know, believe in science, uh, up and down the ballot. I mean, uh, there's no way to even begin to uh, start to address these problems without believing in the data that is coming out of our scientific community. And we also um, know that this election is only a comma on this movement. It's not a period. And even if we do elect Biden and Harris, um, and all the folks down the ballot, we still got a lot of work to do ahead of us. And so nobody knows about this work and how important it is more than Bernie Sanders. He has been a climate champion fighting on the front, line, front lines for so long. Um, there has been no other politician that was more willing to talk about this in the most honest terms um, he's never played politics with it. Um, he has connected the dots to show us um, that people and uh, that climate change and racial equity and justice cannot be separated. That these are all intersectional problems that are connected to climate change. It's why we're in this mess and it's how we're gonna get out of this mess. Um, and Bernie, I want to I want to throw it to you and ask you um, why that matters uh, in this election and why this election is so important on all these fronts. Thank you, Senator. Well, Mark, thank you, and thank you for using your uh, prominence as as one of the great actors in the country uh, to bring people together uh, to focus on what amounts to the uh, great existential threat not only facing our country, but the entire world. So Mark, thank you uh, so much for what you're doing. Uh, Mark asks, why is this important? And the answer is, um, well, it only has to do whether or not the planet survives, uh, whether billions of people uh, are able to live healthy uh, and sustainable lives or not. So what we are talking about is in fact uh, the future of this planet, not just for ourselves, but for our kids and for our grandchildren. If we were living in normal times, 
And if we did not have a pandemic, which has taken 225,000 lives, if we did not have an economic collapse, which has cost many millions of Americans their jobs and their incomes and their health insurance, uh, if we were not plagued by the systemic racism that we see out on the streets every single day in terms of police brutality and murders, if we did not have a president who lies every single day and is trying to undermine American democracy, if we didn't have all of these things at this unprecedented and crazy moment in American history, what we would be talking about every single day is in fact climate change. We'd be talking about what's going on in the west coast of this country, in California, in Oregon, in Colorado right now, unprecedented forest fires which are destroying millions of acres of land. And our firefighters are saying, we have never seen anything like this. And what we would be talking about is the kind of drought that we are seeing around the world and in the United States, where if we do not get a handle on that drought, food production is going to go down and the quality of food being produced is going to deteriorate. And if we weren't in these crazy, crazy times, we'd be focusing on rising sea levels and what they will mean to coastal communities, not only in the United States, whether it is Miami or Charleston or New York City, but coastal communities all over the world in terms of flooding and people being forced to migrate. Uh, what we would be talking about is the warming of the oceans and the acidification of the oceans and what that means to marine life and what's that, what that means to communities and all of us who depend upon fish for our uh, nutrition. What we would be talking about is mass migrations of people who when they are no longer able to grow the crops that they need to survive or get the drinking water they need are forced to go by the millions and to migrate and to go into other territory, which causes international conflict and the potential of war. That is what we would be talking about if we weren't in such a crazy moment. But given the fact that we're in a crazy moment, we cannot ignore that reality. And as Mark just mentioned, what the leading scientists in the world are telling us is this is not a problem that we have 20, 30, 50 years to deal with. What they are saying is there will be irreparable harm done to this planet in terms of droughts, flooding, extreme weather disturbances, acidification of the ocean. There will be irreparable damage done if we do not get our act together within the next few years. And tragically, tragically, and I, I say this not from a political perspective, but just tragically, we have a president of the United States who, A, does not believe in science, does not believe in the reality of man-made climate change. And in fact, through his policies and his support of fossil fuel, has only made a very bad situation even worse. So this election, yeah, it is about our very lives, the quality of our lives. It is about what happens to our kids and our grandchildren. Because if you think that what's going on in Colorado tonight, what's going on in California, what's going on on the West Coast is some kind of freakish one in a hundred year event, you got it wrong. This is what Obviously, we're having some technical difficulties. <laughs> so we'll we'll take care of that. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We're going to log the senator back in. Really appreciate everybody tuning in. We have a great panel lined up for you, though, so I want to get right to it. 
Um, let's uh, go to our next guest, David Wallace Wells. David Wallace Wells is the deputy editor of New York Magazine and the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, The Uninhabitable, Uninhabitable Earth, uh, Life After Warming. Welcome to the show, David Wallace Wells. How you doing? I'm okay. I'm, you know, anxious and looking forward to next Tuesday, like I think probably everybody else on this panel. Um, and I'm privileged to be, feel privileged to be talking about climate on that occasion um, and heading into an election in which for the first time really ambitious climate is on the agenda and on the ballot um, at the presidential level in part because of the work that Senator Sanders um, has put in both in his own you know, career as a senator, but also um, on the teams he's put together with, um, with Joe Biden. Also thanks to all of the activists that have been working on this so hard, especially over the last couple of years and maybe most especially the Sunrise Movement. Um, but also because for the first time, I think Americans are really seeing climate change um, in their daily lives. Five years ago, 10 years ago, this was something we talked about as arriving in the distant future. And now we see it in real time. And while we may feel in seeing those impacts that what we're seeing is a, is a glimpse of the future, which it is, um, it's also, I think, really important, and this is what um, Senator Sanders has asked me to talk about, it's really important to keep in mind that what we here in America and in Europe, places like Europe, see as the future, many parts of the world are already dealing with today in the very present tense. So, you know, we talk about this year's California wildfire season as horrific and unprecedented it is. It's, it's more, it, more than twice as much land has burned this year um, than burned in the worst year previously on record, which happened just two years ago. But Australia's bushfires from last year burned 10 times as, many, as much land as has burned in California this year. And Australia is an unusual case in that it's a country that is relatively wealthy and has the capacity to do a lot of adaptation and response much of the rest of the world is in even a worse spot. There have been studies saying that many equatorial countries have lost as much of, as a third of their potential economic growth over the last generation already because of climate change. And those impacts that they're seeing across Africa and South Asia um, are really terrifying when we bear to look at them from the vantage of the US. And we owe it to ourselves as moral actors to do that. Um, just during the pandemic, just over the last 12 months, we've seen a locust cloud produced by climate change, billions of locusts eating up millions of, of acres of land across East Africa and South Asia, pushing as many as 5 million additional people um, to the brink of starvation. Bangladesh had one completely historic cyclone, and then a month later, a third of the country was underwater because of unprecedented flooding. Um, We've seen heat waves across the Middle East topping 120 degrees. Um, and almost none of this has even made news in the US, let alone the tens of millions of people who were evacuated um, because of river flooding in China just this year, just during the pandemic. Um, we're so focused on the lives that we lead and the life of our country that we don't see just how grim and urgent the problem really is elsewhere in the world where it um, dominates in a way that we have yet to experience here. And it will get worse. Um, it will get worse in those parts of the world. Scientists expect that even in a kind of a best case two degree of warming scenario, 150 million people will likely die of air pollution. Most of those in the developing world, 150 million people. Um, they expect that cities in South Asia and the Middle East that are today home to 10 or 12 million could become so hot that during summer there'd be days when it would be hard to walk around outside without risking heat stroke or death, not to mention the effects on agricultural yields um, and migration. And I think maybe most conspicuously, um, the plight of Africa, I think really, really hangs on the future of climate change. We're already seeing as a continent, they're spending as much as 9% of their GDP on adaptation. Um, we're talking about, you know, Mozambique would, had their GDP forecast cut in half this year by a single storm. Um, and all of the crops that are grown, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, are so vulnerable um, to climate changes that already the growth just since 2012 of people on the brink of starvation um, in Sub-Saharan Africa has grown by 45%. Now, these are all quite grim futures. And how far we get along those paths 
remain entirely up to us. In fact, that will always be the case. And I think it's critical to keep in mind that even as we begin to see in real time the dramatic effects of climate change and even normalize them to some degree so that we unfortunately accept them more than we ever hoped we might have, there's always going to be more to do to stop more future warming and make sure to build in more resilience and uh, more endurance and more ideally more human flourishing and human health. That will always be the dilemma in front of us. And as we do that, I think it's really critical to keep two really big things in mind, especially when we take the global picture, which is climate change is not compartmentalizable. It's not only happening in one discrete place or five discrete places in a way that allows anyone, even the wealthy among us, but especially the poor and those struggling to attain human dignity in the world. It, it will, we, none of us can escape it. It is an all encompassing system that unless we take action quite quickly, will degrade all of our lives in the future. And relatedly, it is transparently, obviously, in ways that I think everyone on this call understands in their blood, but which is nevertheless worth repeating every time we talk about it. It is a justice issue. It is about global inequalities and inequalities within nations and even within cities and communities, because it is always the people who have the least who will suffer the most from these changes. Typically, those are people who have done the least and countries that have done the least to produce these problems. And we need to start thinking not just about whether America has an appropriate climate policy, um, whether we're on the right track, but what we can do as Americans, the country that is responsible for the lion's share of historical emissions, to safeguard the well being and, and um, prosperity and health of those living elsewhere in the world who have not yet grown off of fossil fuels in the way we have and are not themselves, um, you know, don't, are not endowed with the resources that we have to protect one another. We need to think of this as a global issue in which all of us, the fate of all of, our, all of our lives are stitched together and to start thinking as much as we can that the lives of people living elsewhere, no matter where they are, are as important as those living close to us and everything we can do to protect them by mitigating the damage from climate change and by adapting to what change is inevitable, we must do. The American effort has to start with this election. It has to be a page turner, but as the Senator said, it doesn't end with election day. We need to fight beyond even the great ambitions of Joe Biden's climate plan, much more ambitious than anything that's come before. We have to go much farther and that is up to all of the activists, all of the politicians, and all of us citizens who are looking out at the world and wanting to preserve as much of its flourishing and prosperity and justice as we possibly can. So I look forward to entering that era on November 3rd, in part because of the leadership of the Senator, but also in part because of the work of so many other people, including those of us on this call. We have, we have to begin as soon as possible and work as quickly as we can and get as much done as possible to preserve as much of the future of the planet as we can. Thank you, David. And you're making the case as to why not only is our president important, but we need national leadership all across the country. And that is why I'm very excited to introduce our next guest. Uh, Marquita is the Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate in Tennessee. She grew up in South Memphis and raised her son on a working class salary as a single mom and has extensive experience in the environmental justice movement and is an advocate for human rights. Welcome to the show, Marquita. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, I have to start um, how my family and I came into the political process. 25 years ago, we found out that we were living down the street from a military landfill. And that means that the chemicals there were made just to kill people and plants very effectively. We knew that we wanted our democracy to look different. We didn't want people to have to live in a way where their air, soil, and water was unsafe. And that's when we became a part of the environmental justice movement. Um, we are a part of a system where systematic racism even happens when environmental laws are in force. Um, environmental racism happens when 
Black, Brown, Indigenous, and poor white communities don't experience the environmental laws, the same as more affluent communities who have more connections to the political system and so may not get the landfills and may not get the uh, the jobs that actually put the pollution in their communities. Um, and so what happens is that working people, because we're at work, we don't get the decisions to say how our communities are developed because we don't have time to go to the planning meetings in the middle of the day that determine what type of industries are in our neighborhood. We, are, we don't get to go decide how much those industries pay. We don't get to decide how our neighborhoods are basically shaped. And so environmental justice is a movement that deals with creating healthy and safe communities where people live, learn, work, worship, and recreate. And you do that by making sure that there are foundational pillars. So you cannot talk about climate justice without talking about pollution. That is the source of climate justice is, I mean, you can't, the source of what's going on with our climate crisis is pollution and the way we are, our relationship is with the earth as far as clear cutting trees um, and changing uh, our wetlands and different things like that. So if you would have told me years ago that I'll be talking about cutting trees down or removing wetlands and different things like that, I would have told you, nope, I just want, I just came here to make sure black people don't get killed in South Memphis because of the environmental policies. And, but as I grew in the environmental justice movement, um, I saw how interconnected all the issues are. You cannot talk about environmental policy without talking about uh, infrastructure, without talking about jobs, without talking about education. And so one thing about the environmental justice movement, it actually was able to uh, get to the point where we were able to, to work with Bill Clinton to become an executive order um, where we now look at environmental justice as a legal term. And so it is the federal framework of how we should actually address racism in the environment. And that's making sure that people have healthy and safe communities. And so being an environmental justice advocate, we have actual, let's see, uh, ways that we work with communities to make sure that they have a voice. We believe the people that live closest to the pain should have a voice in the process to be a part of the solution. And so I am the first US Senator to run on an environmental justice platform. And it's based on collecting narratives and actually putting that together to actually inform a platform. And so I didn't come um, with a platform already formed as a candidate for US Senate. We formed those over the state of Tennessee in 95 counties. So what does environmental racism look like in the state of Tennessee? We have 1,100 national priority list Superfund sites, active Superfund sites, and archived Superfund sites. And just because a site is archived doesn't mean it's healthy or safe. It just means that it's not a priority to clean up because based on the money or either it's just not on people's radar um, as important because of some places are just so much more hazardous. And those, it, like the one that was down the street from my house, which was a national priority list Superfund site one of the dirtiest ones in the nation. And so if we have 1,100 Superfund sites and we have 95 counties, right? And when you look at Memphis, Tennessee, you have about 220 of them. We are disproportionately carrying our, our weight when it comes to the burden of pollution. And when you look at Morristown, even though it's a smaller population, and it's a white community, basically white community, they are carrying their burden based on their population. And so that happens throughout Tennessee. And so the way I talk about climate justice and the Green New Deal is in a way that brings people together. Uh, here in Tennessee, some people are shut down if you say uh, climate, uh, climate justice or climate change, they'll shut down, but they understand pollution 
and they understand that we have industries that's based on having clean air, clean water, and clean soil here in Tennessee when it comes to this great, beautiful state and also our farming industry. Right now, we have farmers that are also experiencing flooding and losing land and actually are being phased out from farming and not able to pass it down because of what's going on in, 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 when it comes to climate. We also have people who have to go to work each and every day and put food on the table and their whole industry is based on polluting the streams, rivers and waters that's around their communities that they live in. And also that's not freedom when you have to go to work and you're for forced to pollute. And so we have to change the industries and move them away from pollution and pain to actually being the solution in order to move us forward to where we are moving in a way where we are rebuilding our communities with renewable energy, rebuilding our infrastructure to make sure water is actually clean in all houses, schools, and businesses across the United States while bringing good jobs. And so when I talk about the Green New Deal in that kind of way, about what's actually in it, when it comes to the infrastructure and what kind of benefits that people have, what does that look like? You have Republicans voting for a first time U.S. Senate candidate from South Memphis. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marquita. We appreciate you and all the amazing work you're doing in Tennessee. And we have the Senator back with us. So Senator, I wanted to turn back to you. Um, Davis Wallace Wells gave us you know, deep insight on what's happening in the international community. Marquita talking about why she's running for Senate to take on climate change. Um, so back to you, sir. All right, Marquita, thank you very much for all the great work you're doing. And David, I missed your presentation, but I read your book. So that counts for something, right? <laughs> um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Juan Paras, who is the co-founder and co-director of Texas Environmental Justice Advocacy Services in Houston. Uh, Juan has 40 years of organizing experience focused on social services, labor, and environmental justice. Juan, thanks so much for being with us. And thank you very much for inviting us. Uh, again, I'm Juan Parras, director of Texas. And uh, just to let you know in a little bit of history, can you see me okay? Because you're looking good. Okay, thank you. Somebody accidentally moved the computer, so yeah. it, it was preset. Anyway, thank you. Uh, uh, the, the way that uh, my wife and I started working on environmental justice issues was actually by accident. I was unemployed, got a job in Louisiana, and it turns out that uh, it was the battle of the, one of the first battles in dealing with environmental justice. Japanese company wanted to build a uh, Shintak in Convent, Louisiana, and make a long story uh, short, we were successful in defeating that. Uh, Imelda West was a strong advocate. Uh, community. We were working with a whole, a whole bunch of folks, well, community of color in New Orleans, and also in uh, Canada, Louisiana, Plaquemine, and all those areas. So we won that case. And after that case, uh, I got a job in Houston, Texas. So when I came back to Houston, on, on, our, on my way to work one day, my wife took me to work because she needed the vehicle. And she noticed this huge billboard sign that I had seen, but really not paid attention because I was driving, right? But it said, future side of new high school. And she says, look, I said, yeah, I've seen that sign. She says, but look what's behind it. And behind this huge billboard in the distance, you could see the smokestacks of the petrochemical plants and refineries. And, that, and it turns out, that, you know, that school eventually was built, but we fought like crazy to not get it built. Uh, that school is named after Cesar Chavez. It's within a mile radius of Texas Petrochemical, Exxon Mobil, and the other one is Texas Swimmer and Goodyear Tire and Rubber. So when you consider that there's three major facilities in the city of Houston outside, you know, right outside, almost outside the boundaries of Houston, but within the city limits, are contaminating that school. Uh, we had just fought in Louisiana also against the siting of, you know, petrochemical plants right next to schools. So it, needless to say, like I said, the, Ch the Chavez High School was built. Uh, 
at that time, we didn't have an organization, so we called ourselves Unidos Contra Environmental Racism, trying to make it bilingual, right? Unidos Contra, and then United Against what? Environmental Racism. From there, what we did is we continued fighting for environmental justice issues because we learned about the Manchester community, the East Side communities. We lived in East Houston, uh, not very far from the chemical corridor, the 52 mile stretch of chemical plants. So <clears throat> over time, what we did is in 2006, we applied for a nonprofit organization and we received our status in 2006. And since then, we've, we have been working actively on environmental justice issues. And I'll tell you, there's an, abund an abundance of environmental issues that we have here because we have the longest stretch of chemical plants and refinery plants. It's a 52 mile stretch of chemical plants and refineries. So the, the job is not easy. Uh, we don't look at it as a job, but we look at it as a mission to try to help our communities of color. <clears throat> and, and, in that, and in that case, what happens is that we find that a lot of our communities are aware of the issue. They feel challenged by the issues because a lot of our communities do not speak English as their first language. And those that do still are being challenged because the huge corridor here of industrial facilities also provides a lot of jobs. And we're not anti-jobs. And before, before all this involvement in the environmental justice movement, I was actually an international union representative and in representing workers, you know, in the public sector with AFSCME International. And my wife was a union president of her local in Corpus Christi. So we firmly believe and support unions, you know? So when it, we moved to Houston and we were ch found this challenge of environmental justice and we had to deal with an industry, the, the first perception is with, with workers and union workers, and the, and the industry does this with a purpose, right? They tell them that those activists, those union, I mean, those environmental groups, all they want to do is, you know, eliminate your jobs. Uh, but we don't want to do that. We know that there is what they call job, you know, transition of jobs, you know, uh, transition. yeah, jobs transition. So what we're working on is we're pushing for uh, the uh, windmills. Texas has a lot of windmills and also the clean energy. Good. Well, uh, let me just say one, thank you for the enormously important work that you are doing in terms of climate justice. Uh, as Marquita said, and as you said, we know that a lot of the pollution, a good percentage of the pollution, ends up in low-income minority communities. Uh, but you also made a good point that when we transition to sustainable energy like wind, it turns out that Texas, in fact, is one of the leaders in the country in producing wind energy. And in fact, they do it at a very reasonable cost. So there's great potential in terms of job creation in wind, solar, energy efficiency, uh, transportation, agriculture. There are millions of jobs that can be created. And your point is well taken that we are certainly not anti-jobs. We believe that we can create a hell of a lot more jobs than will be lost by moving to clean energy. Uh, but anyhow, Juan, thank you so much for your work. Uh, let me introduce now Zach uh, Unger. Uh, Zach is an active firefighter. He is president of the Oakland Firefighters Union, IAFF, Local 55, uh, in California. And he is the author of Working Fire, The Making of a Fireman. Zach, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much, Senator Sanders. I really appreciate you having me here. And I appreciate your leadership on climate and on keeping the labor movement vibrant. You know, when I started as a firefighter almost 25 years ago, we used to talk about wildland season. But now with climate change, wildland basically means everywhere and there's no longer a season. You know, I worked the Santa Rosa fires in 2017. There were 24 people died and almost uh, 5,000 homes destroyed. And that wasn't a cabin in the woods, that was a city. That was just a regular neighborhood like you would see anywhere else. And then I worked a fire in Oakland just yesterday where we lost two homes and had the wind shifted just a little bit, we could have easily lost a hundred homes or more. So wildland now for us basically means everywhere from the suburbs to the big city. And as for the season, you know, we used to count on being done fighting those wildfires by October. But in the last few years, we've been fighting fires all the way up to New Year's Day. And our resources are stretched incredibly thin. California fighter fighters now, we routinely spend all summer and fall bouncing around the state from fire to fire to fire. My scheduled work week is 52 hours. 
I haven't worked fewer than 120 hours in a week since July. The toll on firefighters is really immense and the toll on our families is really the hidden tragedy that we don't talk about enough. But for me, it's an incredible honor to be able to protect the public and do this job and work with the men and women who are my colleagues. But the job is growing unsustainably more dangerous every year because of climate change. And you know, even when we're not on wildfires, we're inundated with the smoke from them all over the West. You know, we, we talk now about, oh yeah, it's October, you're not gonna be able to breathe, it's smoke season. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't have smoke season, we just had Halloween, but now it's sort of a, we take it for granted. Um, this summer in Oakland, we had 30 straight days of unhealthy air and Oakland already has one of the highest rates of asthma nationwide and our kids are really suffering. With these wildfires, we also have blackouts, both planned and unplanned. And you think of the elderly, disabled folks trying to endure a blackout for five or six days in the heat of the summer and this oppressive smoke. We have a generator at my firehouse and last summer we had a line of people trying to charge up their breathing machines and batteries for their diabetes insulin pumps. It looked like a field hospital in there. I've had my own members lose their homes. I've had my members lose their homes while they're busy fighting fires to save other people's homes. The workload has increased, the hazard has increased, the toll on our working men and women is really at a breaking point. And it's hard to believe that it's just gonna keep getting hotter, that the wildfire zone is gonna get bigger and that the season is going to keep getting longer. And you know, I, I just wanna end here by asking everyone on this call to send their love to our brothers in Orange County. We had two brave young men who were overtaken by a wildfire just a few days ago. Uh, they're covered in second and third degree burns and they're on ventilators. So oh, wildfires aren't theoretical for us. It's not a policy debate. This is our brothers and sisters literally fighting for their lives out there. So thank you for having me here to talk about wildfire. Well, Zach, you know, you've kind of left me speechless here and, 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 and certainly we send our love and our prayers to your two fellow firefighters. And want to thank you and, and firefighters all over this country for every day putting their lives on the line to try to save our lives and our property. Uh, I was out in Paradise, uh, California, and that may ring a bell with some viewers, uh, where they suffered a terrible, terrible uh, fire a couple of years ago. Uh, and it was just unbelievable to see what we saw. Uh, but Zach, uh, thank you again. Um, and, and thank you to your colleagues. Um, and um, as a member of the United States Senate, uh, I certainly, and I know my colleagues will do everything we can to make sure that uh, you guys get the resources that you need uh, to continue to, to do the work you're doing. Uh, our next guest is Alex O'Keefe. Alex is the creative director of the Sunrise Movement, helping to build the campaigns to elect and pressure politicians to act on climate. Uh, Alex grew up in Florida. Alex, thank you very much for being with us. Thanks, Bernie. Um, and if I may quote the man himself, the, the system rarely makes the mistake of letting someone like me in because growing up impoverished and black in the South, your life is political. I grew up in Florida. I grew up with five hurricanes a year sometimes. And people report on the death tolls, they report on the houses washed away to sea. But what they wouldn't be there for is everything that happened later on. If we weren't able to afford to prepare our shingles five times a year, you'd get a hole in your ceiling. And that hole would get bigger every year and every hurricane. And we got a hole in our ceiling and I would come home from school and sometimes the water would be up to my ankles. And then that hole would get bigger. It leaked on our furniture, it ruined our furniture and that hole would get bigger. And a lightning bolt ruined our fridge. We had to live out of a cooler. I had to steal food from Walmart and I got arrested. There was a cop to deal with a problem that a retrofitter could have dealt with. And that hole would just get bigger. My family was poor. We couldn't repair this hole. We had no hope of repairing the hole. So we just ignored it. We're not supposed to look at the hole. It's just there. We just live with it. And in 2007, when the top 1% tore a hole in our economy, my family fell in. Where I'm from in Florida, many, many families were evicted. And yet I would walk around and see these fields and fields of empty houses that no one lived in. Houses that were kept empty because somewhere some billionaire made a bet. I started to realize early on that we are living in the wildest dreams of a few billionaires. Debt does not flow down the river. Coal does not burn in the wild. There were no militarized police patrols of Pangea. So who made that up? Who gets to dream in society? At Wall Street right now, there are rich men waving their hands ecstatic, 
betting and believing in many possible worlds, oil futures, they design a system to make you hopeless because hope is dangerous to them. Hope is a radical form of labor. It challenges all of us, not just to consider a better world, but to consider ourselves within it. How would we build it? How would it work? How would it change our work? Hope is weaved into the Green New Deal. Militant optimism is the ethos of Sunrise Movement. And I am grateful to be a witness to this history because if I just heard about it, I probably wouldn't believe it. That a couple kids, teenagers even, transform the agenda of a Democratic Party. It's funny, when we first put out the Green New Deal and Trump attacked it, the establishment said we had no shot. They said, abandon all hope. We did not abandon hope. We took on the fight. And today, you know what the number one swing issue for young Black folks, young Latinos, even center-right Republicans is? This election, the number one swing issue is climate. And not just because more people believe in the science, but because more people believe in the future. That's what you call a paradigm shift. So when Bernie invited Sunrise to, jo to join Joe Biden's climate policy task force, we seized the opportunity. We redesigned Biden's climate plan with the vision of the Green New Deal. That is why Biden's move to frame himself as a Rooseveltian president is so significant. He has promised $2 trillion spent to combat climate change in the next four years with 40% of investment going to communities on the front lines of this crisis. He has pledged for a complete abolishment of fossil fuels by 2035 and to create millions of green union jobs in the process. All my life, they said that every single one of those policies was impossible. So what happened? Biden is not some visionary, but our vision, the vision of people like on this call, the vision of people who are listening to my voice right now. Our vision has become the savviest political calculation he can make. Biden's climate plan is more popular than Biden. And if Biden carries out his agenda, experts estimate that 20 million Americans would be lifted out of poverty. I'm one American lifted out of poverty. I gotta tell you, it's pretty good. But the only way we can accomplish the Biden agenda and push it way further is if we turn out a multiracial, multi-generational cross-class coalition to win this election with a climate mandate. It has to be clear, it has to be loud. I believe this will be the decade of the Green New Deal. And they may say, oh, that's naive, that's impossible. But you know what? We as a society, we've operated from a place of cynicism for quite a while and it hasn't really worked out for us. So what if for one generation, <laughs> for 10 years, we wage a militant optimism? They're going to tell you, and they've been telling me for years now, oh, that's just not the way the world works, kid. But we are the workers, and we are the builders. So let a new world be born from our bricks. Well said, Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernie. And thank you for inviting us to that climate task force. Without you, we couldn't have transformed Biden's, uh, Biden's policy. So I really appreciate you. And you're right, and you're absolutely right in saying that what Biden is proposing is good politics, it is popular, and when we implement that, we're gonna create millions of good paying jobs. So Alex, thank you for your great work and thank you uh, to the, all those folks in the Sunrise Movement. Uh, our next panelist is Joseph Beaker. Uh, Joseph grew up on a non-traditional farm in Ames, Iowa. He is a regenerative farmer, growing perennial crops like hay and raising livestock. Joseph, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm pretty humbled to be on with this group. So uh, I just want to speak to um, kind of the view from here in Iowa uh, and what we can do as farmers to uh, contribute to a solution to climate change. Uh, for a little bit of background, uh, my family farm here is located in central Iowa. Um, I would say in the last five years, we haven't had a normal year uh, in terms of climate. Uh, pretty hit or miss uh, this past year, been a pretty severe drought. Uh, 15 years ago, my family made a conscious decision to transition our farm from a traditional uh, row crop, uh, corn and soy farm, uh, into something that, uh, number one, would be better for the environment. Uh, the local environment was always the most important to us here, 
we live in a river valley. Um, and so we, we transitioned to uh, hay uh, and then grass-based cattle. Um, and we've done that for the last uh, 15 years. Um, I also have done, uh, worked with the Rodale Group, uh, the Rodale Institute. We put out a paper in 2014, a white paper surveying um, basically farming system trials uh, around the globe, uh, looking for a solution uh, to climate change using, using agriculture. And it's, it's really uh, the role of the farmer um, to help solve uh, climate change by using uh, regenerative agriculture uh, as defined as uh, various practices, but rotational grazing, rotational crop, uh, cover cropping, um, various systems to keep uh, <laughs> keep us going. There was a question I noticed uh, earlier in the uh, Q and A. Uh, they asked, "Is climate change on uh, the radar for for farmers?" And yes, yeah, one hundred percent, it is. Uh, in one way or another, there are many people that are looking for technologies to solve that problem, or there are others of us that are looking for existing technologies uh, uh, to help solve that problem. So uh, I try to use my farm here, uh, my family farm here in central Iowa as uh, an experimental ground um, for looking for what works in central Iowa in the Midwest uh, to not only adapt to our claiming, uh, changing climate, but also uh, hopefully reverse what is happening to our climate. Um, things that work here in central Iowa, we, you know, we mix in native species, hot season grasses uh, into our uh, pasture and hay mixes. Uh, native grasses that are naturally tolerant to drought and uh, uh, high temperatures. Uh, traditionally cold season grasses are used and they just stop. Uh, so we, we experiment with some of those things. Um, we experiment with local agriculture, focusing on locally in the area, selling our product, um, trying to promote that community building. So, uh, like I said, I, I'm not nearly as distinguished as the rest of these panelists, but um, I can say we do focus on what is the solution to climate change here? How can we change our food systems uh, and make them regenerative uh, ones that don't mine our soils, but give back to our soils and, and hopefully uh, turn this <laughs> turn this ship around. So uh, thank you for, for letting me come on and say that. Well, thank you very much, Joseph. I'm not quite sure what the word distinguished means, but if it means hard work, I suspect you and the other farmers in Iowa are very, very distinguished. Um, Misty, um, I think we have some time for uh, Q&A. Yeah, we do, sir. We've got lots of questions rolling in, so I'm going to try to get as many in as we can. Uh, we'll see how this goes. So um, uh, this one comes from, let's start here. Uh, this comes from Nick in New York City. There's a lot of stigma around the Green New Deal, what the Green New Deal represents. What's being done to better transform the message to educate people on what we what is the good thing about the Green New Deal? Well, let me start it off and others, Mark uh, and others can jump in. I think there are a couple of basic points. You know, people say to me, Bernie, you know, Green New Deal is expensive. It is. And you tell me what the alternative is if we're talking about the destruction of the planet. But the good news in terms of the transformation of our energy system away from fossil fuel is A, we can create millions of good paying jobs, far, far more jobs than will be lost in the transition. B, as you've heard, for Marquita and others, and one, is that we're gonna be able to clean up uh, communities now that are hard hit by pollution. Uh, and there is another issue out there that I think does not get enough discussion. Uh, and that is, if we move to sustainable energy, we can save, and energy efficiency, we can save people large amounts of money on your heating bills and on your electric bills. I can tell you that I've helped bring money into Vermont to make homes more energy efficient. And when you do that, when you provide the insulation and the windows and the roofing that people need, you know what? You cut back significantly on your heating bills. And if you move to solar, even in a state like Vermont, where we don't have, we're not Nevada, we're not Florida, but even in Vermont, you can save substantial sums of money, 80, 90% on your electric bill. 
So among other things, many other things, leading the world to combat climate change, obviously enormously important, creating jobs, enormously important, creating cleaner communities, enormously important, preventing disease, enormously important. You could also save money on your fuel bill, also important. Uh, Mark, did you want to jump in on that? I was going to say the thing about the Green New Deal is it's 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 the most opportunity. I mean, right now, one of the biggest untapped markets in the United States right now is solar home, putting solar on homes. I mean, it's a it's a huge market. It's an opportunity for jobs. Um, you're talked about what we would save in transitioning. It's 30 percent. Um, we only use 30 percent of uh, the energy to to actually transition to an electric economy which means that it pays for itself by what we are saving in, um, elect in, in fuel costs. Um, then we get into 2 million people a year are dying from pollution, uh, from fossil fuel pollution. That costs us uh, and our communities billions, trillions of dollars in healthcare um, costs that are offloaded to us. Uh, you know, but, but really, I think, you know, when we're talking about the Green New Deal, it's a bold and simple idea that people can hold on to. It promises 5 million more jobs than we'll lose um, by transitioning away from these dis disastrous, toxic, and, and harmful climate change um, economies. And so it's, the, the world's already moving that way. America is being left behind in the technology that we created, in the, in the actual, um, the space that we invented. And so, you know, I, I, I think the more we talk about this and talk about it boldly and, and, and not, sh not shy away from what this is and what it means, and, and especially for the young people, to listen to their voices, to hear what Alex is saying and his vibrancy. We have a, we have a responsibility to these young people to, to, to address their needs and their desires. And so I think that, you know, I, I see the Democratic Party, you know, kind of like backing away from the Green New Deal, but we should be we should be barreling into it. We should be we should be embracing it, and we should be talking about it every. And we need to educate ourselves a lot better. You know, to hear some of the candidates talk about it, they don't really understand oh, the opportunity that this thing is. So, I think that we we double down on the Green New Deal, not back away from it. Good. So, um, oh, Miss Deep, was that you or? Yeah, it was me. I was just going to say, does someone on the panel know? Because you've talked about fossil fuels. We have a lot of questions about fossil fuels. And there's a very simple one from Maria, Northwest Indiana. How long will fossil fuels even last if we're talking about this? I'm sure one of you on this panel know that. Well, probably let's let's send that over to David. Uh, David, do you want to take a shot at that? Well, at the moment already, it's, it's cheaper to build new solar and wind capacity just about everywhere else in the world, everywhere in the world, than it is to even continue operating fossil fuel, existing fossil fuel infrastructure. So I'm not the biggest fan of markets, but even if markets were able to work their logic, like without interference, without political interference, um, this revolution would be over, at least in the the energy and, and um, the energy side of the, of the problem. Um, so it's really a matter of displacing the political obstacles and the political interference, not just in the US, but all around the world that have made these institutions, these, um, these um, industries so, so powerful. But you know, we were talking about both the job opportunities are much larger than the possible job losses. It's also the case that um, I saw a study this past week that said, at just a fraction, I think the number was 10% of the money that's been spent globally on combating um, coronavirus and stimulating economies in the wake of coronavirus. If that money were spent on an annual basis for the next decade, it would be sufficient on its own to avoid catastrophic warming and land the planet somewhere close to 1.5 degrees. So when we talk about whether something's expensive or not, we have to talk, talk about it in terms of what, um, what costs we're, we, we're possibly avoiding um, we haven't done that enough with climate change, but it's also worth keeping in mind just the scale of what we're, we have, 
as a planet engaged in an enormous amount of spending inspired by the by the pandemic and we we're not going to even need to do that much spending to secure a kind of livable prosperous just um, climate future for ourselves if we have the political courage to force the evil actors out of the conversation and make rational decision that reflects the majority's uh, support of at least in America and, and in many countries around the world. Okay, Alex, I know you've been fighting uh, as hard as you can for a Green New Deal. You got any thoughts on this? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts, Bernie. I have a lot of thoughts on the Green New Deal. I mean, this is my job at Sunrise, right, to popularize the Green New Deal. And when I got it, when I got that Green New Deal, it was deeply unpopular. What a lot of people don't understand is they say, well, why didn't you just pick something that was more popular from the, in the first place? The point is controversy. The point is to lean into a controversy we believe we can win. We could have introduced a resolution for a national dog day, and I'm sure that would have been very popular. It would have passed through the Senate and Congress in a day. That's not the point. This isn't about popularity contest. This is about the future of our civilization, the future of our species. So it was never about let's make the most popular plan. It was about let's make the plan that is scientifically necessary and necessary to the poor folks of this country, and then let's popularize it. And that's what I've tried to do. Um, you have to first realize, and I think this has been a problem of environmental politics for a long time. It's not about what we have to sacrifice. And we talk a lot about the problem. We talk about a lot about the dread. I grew up in Florida and I hated environmentalists. I hated Al Gore because all I heard was that my state was gonna sink into the sea. That doesn't make me wanna go and vote. No, I wanna hear about what I have to gain. Okay, tell me everything I have to gain. I don't care about plastic straws. Tell me about that job. I was unemployed perennially in Florida. It's so hard for a black man to get employment in Florida. Tell me about what that job is, what that job looks like, how it can bring meaning to my life. Once you start doing that, you change the entire paradigm. Good, start that's exactly right. Yeah. I don't mean to interrupt you, I've got other questions, but you hit the nail right on the head. We have to tell people what the future looks like. What does a clean environment look like? How many good paying jobs can we create uh, in this country and around the world? Uh, but I want to underline a point that uh, Alex made and Mark made before that. Uh, to win this struggle, we're going to have to have courage. And the courage is to take on the fossil fuel industry. They are enormously powerful. And we have to make it clear to them and to the whole world, not just an American problem, it's a global problem, that the short-term profits of the fossil fuel industry are not more important than the future of our planet. That's the bottom line there. Uh, Misty, you got some other questions? We do. This one says, I read that Alaska's Tungus National Forest will be open to logging tomorrow in, in one of Trump's administration's most sweeping public land rollbacks. What can we do to combat rollbacks like this? Can we expect some of this damage to be mitigated once Biden is elected? This so comes from Gretchen. Answer, the short answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, look, you know, you got a president um, who was doing all of the wrong things, uh, and that is including opening up the Sangus National Forest uh, to forestry. Uh, we've got to be planting trees, not clear cutting them. Uh, David, uh, did you want to jump in on that one or anybody else? Well, you know, the um, yeah, I, I think Biden is going to reverse all that stuff, <laughs> um, and I'm looking forward to seeing that happen. Um, I think it illustrates one of the one of the other selling points of, of the Green New Deal that um, people do, really do respond to the um, these violations of our um, natural resources and our air and water. Um, that even when the term the Green New Deal was you know, was um, on, you know, polling poorly. The idea of clean water and clean air and preserving our forests, all of that stuff was incredibly popular. And it's, it shouldn't be hard to connect all these issues because they are so naturally connected. Um, and the support for them is so strong that any politician who looks at the polls will have no choice but to uh, move at least in the right direction, if not necessarily far, fast enough. Okay, Ms. Lee, what else you got? This comes from Moira, Moira. She asks, can one of the panelists talk about the potential of regenerative farming to help stall the impact of climate change? Uh, Joseph, do you want to hit home on that one? Yeah. Um, so like I alluded to, um, I, I did some work uh, about five years ago with the Rodale Institute with a uh, regenerative, regenerative farming um, system trial. Uh, if I could jump in. Basically, 
we put I ask you to do me a favor? Uh, a white paper uh, analyzing several uh, farming systems trials from around the world and their ability uh, regenerative, what, what we call residue, um, maintaining a residue hey. on fields. Uh, using, uh, okay, Misty, I think we have a technical yeah, jo Joseph, uh, I think we're having compost a compost livestock into farming. Okay. You know, we were using 2012 numbers at that time, but. Okay, sorry, we're having a technical difficulty there. So let's, let's just move to another one. Sorry about that, guys. Um, uh, okay, uh, this one comes from Rita. Rita asks, what does solid waste management come into, wait, where does solid waste management come into climate change? Anybody have thoughts on that? Uh, David, I'm gonna throw it to you. Uh, yeah, I mean, the way that we handle every aspect of modern life ha has some kind of carbon footprint at this point, and we need to reform just about everything from industry to infrastructure to agriculture all the way down the line. It's not just energy. And the management of waste, particularly animal waste, is a part of that. It is one reason why agriculture and land use does produce um, a significant carbon footprint. We need ways of, um, you know, of, of transforming that and responding to it. Um, and there are some technologies on the horizon. They're just not being implemented at nearly the scale that we need to, um, in part because so much of American farming, at least, is controlled by large-scale agribusiness um, that is invested as much um, in continuing to degrade um, the ecosystems of our country and the planet as they are in trying to secure a, a sustainable future for themselves and for the rest of us. Okay. Misty? Yep. Um, so this one is from Barbara. Barbara asks, how do we stop the Koch brothers and the billions of dollars pouring into the pockets of politicians? Uh, well... Um, I'll start that off and others can jump in. Look, um, as I think people have heard me say for years, we have a corrupt political system and the corruption is not just the Koch brothers, but you got a whole bunch of billionaires who are pouring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into the political process. During the Democratic primary, there was a billionaire who said, hey, you know, I think I'd like to become president. I'm worth 40 or 50 billion and I'll spend a billion to get me to be president, he didn't succeed. But it is clearly a, uh, a massive attack on what we believe to be democracy when big money can buy elections. Uh, so what you need is campaign finance reform. Uh, what you need is to move toward public funding uh, of elections. And the truth of the matter is, we are not gonna make real progress in creating a more democratic and responsive society that works for working people rather than the wealthy, unless you really have campaign finance reform, unless you have election reform and stop the voter suppression efforts that we're seeing all over the country, we're seeing it right now. Uh, but uh, anybody else wanna jump in uh, on what amounts to uh, billionaires buying elections? Mark Ruffalo or? You know, listen, we're, we're gonna have to have this fight at some point. And, um, and it's really gonna be up to us. Uh, and there's no one else is gonna do it. And, and once, you know, e even if we lose this election, we have to, we have to put people in, in power, elect them that we know are going to be willing to fight this fight to do what you did, Bernie, and say, no, I'm not taking fossil fuel money. You created a movement um, that has has taken hold and has changed and revolutionized the way we're, we're financing campaigns. Um, and I think we we just make sure that our candidates are our candidates, uh, like you've been and so many other progressive people. And these people are already coming forward um, to run. Um, and you know, I, I it's a tough question. Uh, but the more we say we're not taking your money in campaigns, the less beholden we will be to these interests. And it turns out that when you don't take money from billionaires or corporate PACs and you can speak the truth about people's lives, people are willing to fork over you know, $15 or $27 or whatever it may be. And you can raise the money that you need to run winning campaigns. 
And we have seen progressive camp candidates all across this country uh, run without run for office, raise money without getting corporate PACs, and doing so uh, around an agenda that works for working people. And I would uh, just say, just to add for a quick second, it's you know it's not just a matter of um, securing our democratic systems. I think the courts are increasingly becoming a real threat to some of this as well. Um, you know, the whole reason that the federal government is at the moment entitled to regulate carbon emissions is because of a narrow ruling that is under threat under a new court. And it's, of course, you know, Amy Coney Barrett's nomination was supported in part by the Kochs as well, not to say um, that is their doing that she's on the court. But um, this, this, it almost goes beyond the simple, um, you know, uh, the simple dignity of our democracy right. um, and extends all the way through um, the systems of government, which are perverted by these forces. Bernie, can I plug something real quick? Because sure. the no fossil fuel money pledge, Bernie signed it first, then Beto signed it, Warren signed it. We got every single one of the presidential candidates to sign it. You start off with the politician who's your ally. You use them to leverage every politician who's not your ally. Immediately, if Biden wins, we're going to have to press him to make sure that we don't have a fossil fuel cabinet. And we're going to need people on the streets. We're going to need people in offices. We're going to need direct action. So you have to get involved in the movement to make sure even beyond elections that we don't get that sort of uh, influence in our politics. That is right. And so we have heard a lot tonight about climate change, what we're facing together as a nation and together as an international community. Um, I want to thank Mark Ruffalo for joining us tonight. Mark, you have been a leading voice uh, on this issue. Um, you reached out. You wanted to make sure that we are leading with this, um, this issue as we go into this election. Uh, we've talked about some solutions for climate change. The vote is just about six days away to this election. Um, so so Mark, what are other things that people should be doing right now who are watching if they want to make a difference on climate change, if they care about these things that we've been talking about tonight? Well, like like Alex was just saying, you know, uh, a um, this this election is the comma on a movement, and this movement is is decades uh, coming, and it's decades ahead of us, and so we have work to do for uh, in front of us. But you know, this is there's so much opportunity here. We're talking about living in a world that's clean, that our water is clean, our air is clean, our kids don't have asthma, grandma and grandpas aren't dying uh, young because of uh, pollution. We're talking about, you know, not having to fight geopolitical wars or, and, or, or protect geopolitics, uh, fossil fuels in, ge in, in geopolitical strategical places. There's so much opportunity for jobs here, real good paying jobs for energy dollars to stay in our communities instead of sending them away out of state and um and so that you know we have to we have to lift ourselves up into into the possibility to, to the imagination of this time it's not just the negative it's it's the it's the possibility and and that's what we're talking about so we have to vote for that as much as we have to vote against trump we're voting for the possibility of our future and so what we do we got to get out and vote the days are over now where we can mail in uh, our votes. We have to show up at the polls now. If you're healthy enough to show up to the polls, you show up to the polls. There's a CDC uh, platform out there right now that tells you how to vote safely. Uh, the, all the voting stations are set up for us to vote during COVID. We cannot mail our ballots in right now. The USPS, the U United States Postal Service is, is stymied. They're not going to get our ballots in time. So if you can show up at the polls, show up at the polls and do it in triplets. Bring your friends, make a plan, get there. Everything's better in threes. And make sure that you tell your families and, and, and your friends to do the same. We have to use relational organizing now, folks. That's where, that's where our real power is. It, it's in our relationships to each other and have those conversations. Everyone's doing it right now. And be a voter, be part of this monumental historical moment. We're, we are already surpassing the, the biggest uh, turnout in voter history in the United States in 1906 with what's being projected today. Be part of that. Be excited by that. Take your place in the history of this movement today. And let's make a world that's good for all of us it's fair to all of us not just a certain very wealthy group of people so let's do this together get out and vote your asses off uh get your family to do the same and let's 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 wake up november 3rd 
and, and see that we've made a, a different world for ourselves and be, and be ready to not know November 3rd as well. Let's make sure every vote is counted. Well, Mark, thank you very much. And what Mark says is your vote is important. You bring out two of your friends, your support has tripled, tripled. So let's reach out to all of our friends, coworkers, family, bring them out to vote. All right, let me conclude by thanking all of our panelists. They did a great job. Thanking all of you uh, who have uh, tuned in this evening. And to just summarize, I guess, what everybody is saying. Uh, you can't sit this election out. This is the most important election in the modern history of this country. Tonight, we've talked about climate change and what happens in this election will determine whether or not we are able to save this planet and leave this planet in a way that's healthy and habitable for our kids and future generations. I can't think of anything more important than that. So let's do it. Let's get out and vote. Let's bring everybody we know out to vote. Let's win this thing. Thank you all very much for being with us. Yahweh Scano, Kukwego. I shall share with you a prophecy that was left to us by the peacemaker as he was leaving the Bay of Quinty. The indigenous people, we are the conscience of this land. We're trying to wake people up. What you're seeing is really, I think, in the beginnings of an international movement. En el campo del reconocimiento de la naturaleza como sujeto de derecho es revolucionario. It's not an environmental movement unless it protects nature as a rights-bearing entity. What do you say to your critics that say, this is absolutely batshit crazy? Absurd. Can I go now? We recognize a right that this watershed has had that's long been ignored. It's right to thrive, to, to flourish. The out-of-state extremists pushing the Lake Erie Bill of Rights don't care about Toledo. Tonight, residents are under order not to drink, wash dishes, brush their teeth, or give tap water to their pets, and not to boil it for use. It is we as man who have strayed from our original instructions. This is the beginning of a legal system in favor of nature. Were you aware of the risks and the potential that you were going to be sued and, and all of that at the time? We were aware ahead of time that we were indeed going to get sued, but we just went ahead with it. Either you stand up or you don't. We don't have an injection well problem, we have a democracy problem. Mm -hmm. We have shifted our government to one that's now become totally corporate control. Capitalism, it was a magic of the price system. Hasn't it given us the highest standard of living in the world? Don't be guilty of that corporate thinking. If you lived in this area, would you want the injection well in your area? Okay, next question. The laws that are in place and the regulations that are in place right now are not working. We can't rely on our legislatures to protect us. So you have the corporation, the federal judge, and the state Department of Environmental Protection all crashing down on this community and attempting to get them to submit to the injection well. I can't support an organization that doesn't believe in, in true environmental protection. And If a corporation has the same constitutional rights as an individual. Why couldn't an ecosystem? Don't lose the faith, don't lose the focus. You just have to keep doing it.